up. So I'll uh, move over to her talk. I'll introduce her as March. Oops, I almost said Bo Lynch. <laughs> March and Stein. Is her husband sitting with her over there? And uh, she's going to give you a talk on a lot of the earlier people in Upper St. Clair, which helped part of us in Bridgeville. Well, as Lou was explaining to you, he kind of cornered me one day, and um, I got involved in doing the reunion for Upper St. Clair, only because most of the people did not know anything about my history. And so when I let it out that you know, I was descended from the people in, in early Upper St. Clair, it was suggested that I do this talk. So let me tell you that I am not formally trained as a public speaker. You'll know that very shortly. <laughs> and the funny thing about what Lou was talking about, we did have this reunion last year. And because I had never given a talk before in front of all these people, I thought, oh boy, this will be tough. Well, it started off by one of the girls that I graduated with coming up to me and handing me this name tag. And I said, what are you doing? She said, and then she told me the story. I said, what on earth? So everybody was chattering, of course, like you do when you first get together after a, re you know, a long time being away and you're at a reunion. They're all chattering and chattering. So I thought, OK. So I said, excuse me, excuse me. And nobody was, you know, they wouldn't stop. I said, pardon me, I really need to ask a question. This is very important. And everybody sort of looked and stopped and looked at me, and I said, um, it, do we have a Kenneth Johnson here in this, in this room? And this guy kind of raised his hand like this, and I said, okay, Ken, I have a question for you. And everybody, you know, they're all sitting there thinking, oh my God, she's going to tell him or his mother just died or, you know, something like that. And I said, don't take this wrong, but I was just handed your name tag, and I want to know why it was on my butt. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the way we started off our meeting. So hopefully I, that's not going to happen tonight. But anyway, um, we all have stories about our families. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. The one thing that I have found in doing research, historical research, is there's a lot that everybody assumes to be correct. So if there are things that I say, and you'll say, oh, no, that didn't happen that way, forgive me. But this was the way it was handed down to me. So what I'd like to do, first of all, is explain to you that um, the first white settlers in Upper St. Clair were the Fife's. And when I say white, I'm not trying to be derogatory to, towards anyone. But that was always the way it was explained to me, the first white settler. So we should, probably could say European settlers or whatever, but that was it. And um, also, when I refer to Indians, instead of calling them Native Americans, uh, I have a couple of good friends that are Apache from Texas. And they said to me one time, Marge, why don't you just call us Indians? All of us Indians call each other Indians. So why don't you call us Indians too? This is ridiculous to call us Native Americans. So I've always been brought up on the name Indians, so if you'll forgive me, that's what I'm going to refer to them today. Um, the first thing is that the Lesnets, the Fifes, the Colwells, the, the uh, McMillans, the McCabes, they all intermarried. And they also liked the name John, William, James, and so forth. So one would name one brother would name his son in, in, um, to, to reflect his admiration for his brother. So John might have William as a son and as a brother. So it became very difficult for us when we were trying to become members of the DAR as to finding out you know, who was who, and you have to look at the dates of birth on those tombstones and all the other kinds of things. So, when I'm talking about certain people, just forgive me if, if I'm just referring to them as their first names. Um, one of the things that's really neat about our family was we started out in Scotland, went to Ireland, of course, which most people did, and then came to the United States. And being in Scotland, uh, we, there was a king who took a shining to the fiefs that were there. 
and he offered them land if they would send so many troops to help him out during certain uprisings. So in doing that, he said to them, I will help you to, um, but I will pay you for sending these troops. And you can either take land in Scotland or you can take land in the wilderness, wilderness being United States, not the United States though. So most of the Fife's took the land and came to the United States. Some of them did stay and they're located in what was Fife County at that time, which is one of the smaller counties in Scotland. And also, um, well, when they were um, given the, this land, they, it was a land grant. Well, the, when the Fife's came over to the United States, they landed in Virginia because they had heard that in New England, Presbyterians were not well liked. So they decided that they would come go further south. So they landed in Virginia and they settled in um, Winchester for a while. And then they um, came to Fort Pitt. They were told that if they hit Fort Pitt, they could get onto Chartier's Creek, follow Chartier's Creek, up until they came to a large stand of white oak trees. If they would get off of their boats at that point, climb the highest hill, face north, and all the land that they could see was theirs. Very enticing, right? So when they did that, they climbed up, they're standing there facing north, and lo and behold, there's an Indian village far away from them, but close enough that they knew they were on supposedly their land. So they went over and became friends with them and um, bought the land from the Indians. And of course they paid for it by giving them a pair of buckskin bridges, a flintlock rifle, and of course the prerequisite bar water. Well, they settled in and you know started to build their homes. They became farmers. They grew all the crops. They had everything that they needed right there on their sites. And the first uh, people who came here for the Fife's, the first white men who were here for the Fife's, um, was John Fife. And um, what at that particular time, there were a whole tribe of Indians that all congregated together. They were all friends and yet not friends. There were Senecas and Iroquois and Mingos, all these names that I'm sure you're familiar with just from being around this area. So um, later, after a certain period of time when the uh, English were trying to make us become, you know, stay with them instead of declaring our independence, they tried to cause an uprising with the Indians against the white people mainly because they figured that they couldn't bring enough soldiers over here to take care of this whole huge area. So um, eventually though, the Indians did leave here in 1791 and they traveled west. Um, I have a map that I'd like to show you and after talking with um, some people, it seems that we're going to be seeing some duplicate photographs on some of the things that you've seen. Now, I call this Memory Lane, Upper St. Clair. Can you all see that okay? There we go. Uh -huh. Okay. This shows you the Indian tribes that were located around um, the, the northern, northeastern section of the United States. Up here, you'll see the Great Lakes. And then coming down this way, this was where the Indians had been. But when the white settlers came, they were forced to move westward. And um, coming up this way, they were forced to move kind of closer towards the north. So coming down from New England, they kind of got squished in the middle right where we are. And that's when they. Um, eventually started moving up. But you can see the Shawnees were here, the Delawares, all in this area. This is Lake Erie up here. Mm -hmm. This is Allegheny County. 
1788, there were seven townships. And as you have all heard, there was an Upper St. Clair and a Lower St. Clair. And the Upper St. Clair was because we were at a higher elevation and the Lower St. Clair was down towards the Monongahela River. But this particular point, we have St. Clair right here. And Mifflin was over here. So all of these townships eventually were divided up also. And then down below here, we had Washington County. And don't forget that at one time, Washington County had claimed Upper St. Clair. And the um, people from Virginia had claimed Upper St. Clair. And the Penns had claimed Upper St. Clair. So that made for an interesting little tidbit. Now, here's Allegheny County in 1800, right here. You'll notice now that there are 10 townships, and they were divided off. Here's, here's you know, the three rivers right here. So Upper St. Clair still was down here. Now this is Upper St. Clair itself when you're pulling into the maps. This is Upper St. Clair itself. You'll notice this one is dated 1786, and the Gilfillans are here in the center, as they are still now. Fife's were all around this area. At one time, the Fife's controlled 1,400 acres of Upper St. Clair. And then this is Upper St. Clair with um, this this is really a neat one because this is 1876 and this actually has um, roads on it and it also tells you where the driveways are for all the people <laughs> and all the little um, schoolhouses that are around here and down here is Bridgeville this charming family is my grandfather's family this is, whoops, sorry. <laughs> Fly through that, right? Okay. This was my grandfather at the age of 10. His name was Samuel McMillan Fife. And these are his brothers and sister. Um, Samuel McMillan Fife was named for Reverend Dr. John McMillan, who was the first uh, Presbyterian minister for this area. We'll get to him in a minute. This was my grandfather. He always had Morgan horses. And um, this was him at a later age. He had several heart attacks during the time that he was farming. And the first one started, strangely enough, in 1929, wouldn't you guess? And um, so he did continue to farm because he had 11 children. And so obviously there were some boys mixed in there too, and so the boys were able to help him out. This was their farmhouse. This is Old Washington Road coming down here. And if you look carefully right back here, this is part of their farm also. And that's Hastings Mill Road. So he had um, approximately 130 acres. It went what would now be a called a cross route 19 and up into that area there where I'm flashing without any screen. And then this part was later um, divided off by my grandfather and he sold the lots to his children so that they could all come and stay there if they had an interest in building a house there on his property. So many of them did. This is the church. This is the church that's there now in place of the farmhouse and the barn. And if you're coming down Old Washington Road, oh, I'm sorry. If you're coming down Old Washington Road right here, right in here you can see an old 
it looks like a 1938 Ford car. Paul, you're a pretty good expert on, <laughs> you can't tell, okay. If you're looking closely at that, you could pretty much tell that this must have been about 1938, which is funny because my mother always said to me, I can't believe how many trees there are now. And this was like, I don't know, 1990 or something like that. And I couldn't understand that because I've always known there to be a lot of trees around. But here you can see it's all been cleared. Very few trees, just right here and here. At the bottom of Old Washington Road, where Johnson Road comes down, is the uh, one of the other original farmhouses. This was a farmhouse at the bottom where Johnson Road meets Old Washington Road. And this was my grandfather's father's home. So my great-grandfather lived here. And they made all of these brick from the land that was right here. They, you know, they dug up the, the clay and made the, the brick themselves. And this is my grandmother with her second child. This is Uncle Ralph. This is Uncle Bill. And then this is her mother who lived here in the farmhouse. And then my parent, my grandparents were just up the street because the farm is all connected at that point. So they had, just in that short period of time, um, and in that small area, they had about 300 acres that they were farming at that time. And this was my grandmother's family. And there's a, a um, guilt villain in here somewhere. I'm not sure who she is, because usually my mother marked all the pictures, but I don't have this one marked as to who Mrs. Gilfillan later became. And this is the Will T. Fife House on Old Washington Road also. And this is close to Route 19. Does anybody know where this farmhouse is on Old Washington Road? Have you seen this? Yeah, this is really a neat house. Um, it used to be said, and I visited there when I was a child, and I know that they went down into this tunnel. Tell them it's hidden behind a well, It's hidden behind a bunch of trees. <laughs> oh, yeah. You'll never see that from the road. Yes, you will never see this from the road. She sneaked up there and took this picture for me. <laughs> but, um, as a child, I remember visiting the farmhouse here, and I know that there was a tunnel, and I don't know where the tunnel went, but that was supposedly the tunnel for the Underground Railroad. And later, um, the man whose son moved into this house recently says that there is no tunnel. So we're going to have to get the girls that uh, were in high school with us, Lou, and ask them whether or not they ever found a tunnel. So where that, exactly is that? This is. I know you said Old Washington. Yes. It, okay. If you are if you are leaving South Hills Village and you're going south, Saint Clair Country Club is on the right hand side. That's Old Washington. This is on the left hand side, and it's on the left hand side, just about three or four houses down on the left. On 19. No, on Old Washington. Old Washington. Mm -hmm. Going towards Saint Clair. No, away from St. Clair Country Club. Yeah, you have to really look for it though because it's up as a long driveway and there are trees in front of the house before, you know, from the street you look at trees. But you can find it. It's easy to find. So is it on the right side of 19 or the left? Oh, it's on the left hand side of 19. Yeah, that church and back up the There's street. a church mm -hmm. on the right hand when side. Where Old Washington begins. Yes. Off yes, and then on the right hand, on the left hand side is where this farmhouse is. I, I, it's the only place with an elevation. Yeah. I think that you couldn't see something. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Correct. Well, that's pretty true. Okay. This is Dr. John McMillan. Excuse me. This is Dr. John Fife, who was my friend, my mother's brother, and somehow I'm missing. Reverend John. But anyway, this man um, was my mother's brother. He admired Reverend John McMillan, and so he decided to emulate going into the ministry and preaching to 
people who were in dire need of, uh, of help. And so he became a minister and um, he was a minister for several years. Um, and then he came to our house one night and um, he was 36 years old and he had a massive hemorrhage and died at our house. In the meantime, he had a son. And his son, right here, and this is his wife, Marianne, he was also John Fife. <laughs> and they both graduated from Pittsburgh Seminary. Um, his, this guy, right here, John Fife, who is just about two years older than I am, um, Paul and I were the first people that he married after he graduated from the seminary. And his father married my parents. So we're talking about Dr. John McMillan. And Dr. John McMillan was the first apostle uh, minister to come to this area. Rumor has it that Dr. John McMillan, um, his father and mother had had a son before Dr. John was born. This was in Virginia in about 1733. Um, Dr. John McMillan's family had this son and something happened to him in childhood and he died. The parents were grief stricken, of course, but they decided to try to have more children and nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened. So Dr. John's father prayed to God and kept insisting on praying to God and said, if you would ever give us another son, I would have him devote his life to um, the word of God. And so when Dr. John Millen was born, he loved all the Bible stories. He loved sitting with his father and um, grew into a, a teenager. And everybody remarked what a wonderful voice he had and how he would be so, so excellent as a minister. And he wanted to become a minister. So he did become a minister. He was ordained. Um, he went to Princeton first because they were living. And this was like 1725. He, he graduated from Princeton. And then he went to seminary in Philadelphia and um, became a minister. And so he came to this area because he felt that there were Indians and people who would need to have some guidance. Um, when he came here, he set up, um, there were three churches that he founded. One of them is Bethel Presbyterian Church in Bethel Park. One is Mingo Meeting House and one is um, Chartier's Hill Church. I don't know if you're familiar with Chartier's Hill Church, yes. but it's up at the corner of Route 19 and 519, and he is actually buried there. Um, when he was traveling through this area preaching, and he would go to Bethel Presbyterian and preach several times, but he never became its, mem its minister, but when he would travel in this area, he would stop to see, um, George Washington would stop to see Dr. John McMillan. Well, Dr. John McMillan made him go to church with him on Sundays, and he kept them there all day, feeding them and so forth, and they chatted quite often. And the reason that he didn't want him to go anywhere at, from his house, because he knew that George Washington would go out and collect the rents for all the property he owned, so he kept them at, their, at his house instead. This is a Mingo Meeting House. This is an artist's rendition of the Meeting House. This is, this is um, W.J. College. Um, oh, sorry guys. This is W.J. College. This is the um, Old Main, I guess you would call it, right here. Dr. John McMillan had founded um, Cannonsburg College and then um, 
W and J became Washington and Jefferson became uh, came from that um, Cannonsburg College, and so he has his saddlebags here. He has um, a number of other places right in here. There's an historic room that has a lot of Dr. John McMillan's possessions in it, as well as Bethel Presbyterian Church, which is right here. Um, Bethel Presbyterian is on Bethel Church Road in Bethel Park. And they also have an historic room. So that would be of interest to those of you who would have an interest in um, the other people that you're familiar with in this area. So uh, Bethel Presbyterian. And then while you're visiting there, you can go and see the tombstones of Bethel Presbyterian Cemetery. Now, I picked the Fife's because I knew that they were um, members. Um, and also, their tombstones are here. Uh, this is William Fife. And you'll notice that they have Revolutionary Soldier written here. This one, uh, William Fife Sr. Was, born, was enlisted in 1781. He was born in 1720 and he died in 1799. Um, there are 14 Revolutionary War soldiers that are buried in Bethel Church Cemetery. Seven of them are fifes. This is another picture of that. And then, um, because we just had Memorial Day, they have all the flags still on. And this is William Fife, who also was a Revolutionary War soldier. Now, those of you who are from this area for a while, you probably remember that Clifton was right through here. This is Old Washington Road. This is not Route 19. This is Old Washington Road that comes down here. And it cuts up this way to go towards St. Clair Country Club. And then it joins McMurray Road right here. And then you had Bethel Church Road, which came down right here and then Drake Road. Um, we had a brick school, which would be Clifton. We had um, a, a few homes that were around this area, like the Phillips House. And then in here, do you remember what they used to call Clifton besides the fact it was named Clifton? Sodom. Sodom, good go. Yeah, and I still want to hear an explanation on that. <laughs> But this area right through here, this has been changed a little bit because McLaughlin Run Road joins McMurray Road differently right now. This was Clifton School, the second one. The first one, um, I believe, burned down. And this is right here, Route 19, coming behind it. When Lou and I were in school, I never even knew that there was a front to it up here that you could see from Route 19. We always came in this way, which is the back of the school, which you'll see is two-storied. And we would always be unloaded from the buses right here. But this was the second school, and as Lou told you, you know, we, we started out here. My mother actually went here, too. Um, and the um, principal here was really funny because when he was um, talking to us, we used to make fun of him, and pardon me for saying this, but we did. And he had a lisp, and we didn't understand. We had no idea what was going on. We were in first grade. And then this is the, uh, these are the teachers that were there. Um, Charlotte Wright and um, Nordzik, and standing behind that is um, Sarah Sarah Hemlinger, and then this is Sarah Lesnett. Those of you who are Lesnitz, anybody here Lesnitz? Good. Miss Lesnett taught us in first grade. So who knows how old she was at that time. This, you know, every, every farm 
in certain areas would have a school on their property. And it was up to the farmer to take care of the school. And um, from what I understand now, they did have people who would come in and um, teach uh, this in the schools. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. Uh, when my grandfather had this school, which was called the Caldwell School, on his farm, and the state paid $18 for the teacher to come in and teach. Now the girls even went to school at that time, which I thought was really amazing. But the boys went only a shorter period of time because they had to be out in the farms, out in the fields. And so the girls would um, get probably about eight months of education, and the boys would only get about five months of education. But they sat in very primitive surroundings and had many, many times to read the McGuffey, McGuffey Reader. And the McGuffey Reader was read and read and read because that's the way they, they were doing it. You, if you were in six years old, it didn't mean you were in first grade. It's whatever your reading ability was. This is the same schoolhouse right now. This is on Old Washington Road, and this is what it looks like now. It is a, it is a residence, and it's for sale, actually. These were the children who attended Caldwell School when this picture was taken. You'll notice the names of uh, Houston's. Oh, see, I keep doing that. Um, the cousins. And then you have Ray Raymond Lesnant and Carl Houston and Lawrence and John Albert Fife. See, I told you there are a lot of Johns. And then Howard Morton. Just, is anybody not familiar with where Morton Road is? <coughs> okay, good. And then the, uh, the teacher was um, Ben Croniser, but Walter Balziberger and the other Balziberger, they were, I, if I'm not mistaken, didn't they live in the Bridgeville area? There was a... There was um, Balziberger's in Ruthford Acres too. They had a farm over there. They were yeah. on the Murray Road. Yeah. <coughs> this was the Macmillan schoolhouse and uh, Rosemary was telling me I put this in for Rosemary um, because this was in 1925 this was the Macmillan brick schoolhouse and then down here you can see where St. John Capistran Roman Catholic Church um, added to the building and they are still using the bell that was in the bell right here in this tower. Could, Rosemary, can you add anything to that? Uh, well, then they added on to St. John uh, Church after that picture. I mean, but you can still see the school rooms in there inside the church. It's very interesting. <coughs> oh, cool. If, and there were outhouses. I heard Lou say about the outhouses. There were outhouses. I was just say in your picture, you can't see our outhouses out back. Yeah, how'd that happen? There, there was a two hole for the guys and three hole for the girls. Seriously? <laughs> wow. That's, that is really weird. <laughs> um, I guess, too, Clifton finally got. Um, Clifton School finally got indoor plumbing, and I think that was done like in 1925 or something like that. So I'm glad it was done when we were there. Okay. Um, this was an interior of a standard school. You'll notice that there are benches. Oh, sorry. There are benches that run along here and desks that were here and a good, good old pot belly stove. And they had certain dimensions that when they were building the school that they had to maintain. 30 by 20 was the standard school. And the ceiling was only eight feet tall because that was the easiest way to keep um, the place warm. These were the first township school buses in Upper St. Clair. And they were, um, there, there were two bus drivers, so we had two school buses. Um, 
One took care of the northern part of Upper St. Clair, and one delivered to the southern part of Upper St. Clair. And this was from 1920s on. They had buses. Well, later, um, after people were allowed to go to Mount Lebanon High School, because we didn't have a high school, they were allowed to drive. Uh, there's a lot of miscommunication in some of the books that you'll read because it says that everybody drove to Upper St. Clair. No, that didn't happen. From the time I was in school, you always drove a, rode a bus. Is that right, Lou, with you? Very, very few cars. We had maybe a dozen that would park up front. Yeah, yeah, that's the way it was, yeah. So, um, then they were talking about somebody came out from the state, and they said in 1965 they came out from the state. And a man drove through Upper St. Clair, and he deemed that it was, the roads were dangerous. So we had to have old buses from then on. Well, we've had buses forever, so I'm not sure where that story came from. But like I said, you know, everybody has their own stories. These are school statistics that you might find interesting. In 1845, right here, um, the school tax was one and three eighths mills. And they collected from the people in the township $395. And the teacher's pay was $18 a month. In 1857, the school tax was six mills. And they collected $2,100. And the teacher's pay was $30 a month. By 1931, 30 and 31, there were um, 497 students, and then in 40, 40 to 41, oh, I'm sorry, 30 and 31, 40 to 41, there were 66 students, or there were um, 563 students. The highest enrollment was in 1973, at that time that they were taking this. This happened in about 1992. The highest enrollment was 5,502 students. In 1989, the enrollment was 3,671. The millage was 76.5, and they collected 14,976,648. Sort of a change. The school year of 1992 to 93, the enrollment was 3,960 students. The millage was 92.75, and they expected to collect 26,194,649, and the teacher's pay could be reached to the 60,000 range. Well, it's even worse than that right now, so you can imagine. <laughs> how much higher the, the taxes are, as well as how much higher the, ta the uh, price that the students or the uh, teachers are paid. This is an overview that um, I find interesting. This was actually Route 19, right here. This up here was all my grandfather's farm and his um, father's farm right here. This is the other side of Route 19. And then this is uh, Old Washington Road. Old Washington Road continues on up. And then this is Johnson Road right here. Remember when we were talking about that? The corner of Johnson Road and Old Washington Road. So up here was where my grandfather's farm was. This was part of his farm also. And these are the lots that he sold off to his children. And um, right in here, in this tree area, is where my great-grandfather lived. So if you're in that area, now you were asking about, about the Will T5 house. If you go from Johnson Road up here on Old Washington Road, you would just keep on going and it would be right up here. I have to tell you a couple stories that I thought were amusing. Say what your head is. Pardon me? Say what your head is. 
Oh, this was 1967. This was the year Paul and I were married. And he and his father had gone on a, um, a, pla a plane ride with a friend who had his own plane. So they flew over my house and they took this picture. So this right here is my house. And uh, up above was Aunt Martha, and down here was Uncle Bill, and down here was Uncle Joe, <laughs> and on and on and on it went. That's it. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Any comments? Yes? Um, your mother and my mother, and we asked for prayers for Amy Perkins, who's death died. They were all in school together in, uh, in Peter's Township. No, Bridgeville. Oh, no. My mother went to Peter's Township. I know my my mother always said that she went to school with her. Well, Marie Five. Marie Five. Yeah, that was. Oh yeah, and that's the story I was going to tell you. Aunt Marie and my mother were opposites. Total opposites. Poor Aunt Bessie got dragged along. Marie Fife, um, when she was married, she became Marie Fife Richards Hunter Richards. My mom got married to Florence Fife Dillinger. <laughs> so when they were when they were very very young, they had a sister who had a, a severe weakened heart, and they took Aunt Bessie with them everywhere that they went. But it was funny because Aunt Marie was such a scallywag that she would do all kinds of things and my mother was a puritanical person and she would be dragged along with it and they dragged Aunt Bessie along too. One day my grandfather said to them when they were just young, really young, young daughters, and he said to them, I want you to get on to the creek and I want you to plant these pumpkin seeds so that they'll be ready for uh, harvesting in the fall. So my mother of course took these seeds and Aunt Bessie and down they go, and Aunt Marie's going, eh, you know, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that, I don't want to do these pumpkin seeds, I don't want to do that. So what they had to do was somebody had to punch a hole into the soft dirt in the cornfield, and the next person would come by and put the pumpkin seed in, and the next person would come by and close it all over so that it would grow. So they did that for a while, and I don't know how long it was, but anyway, um, Aunt Bessie, or Aunt Marie said, I'm tired of doing this. We're not doing this any longer. Let's go. Let's go back up to the house. So they said, well, what do we do? You know, Dad's going to ask us what, what we did with all the pumpkin seeds. And she said, we'll just throw them here in the creek. He'll never know. True. In they went. Don't you know, in the fall, all these pumpkin seeds kept growing out, of, out of, onto the banks. And they had gone up to the house, and my grandfather said, you're finished already? Oh yeah, we you know it didn't take us long. There were three of us, so you can imagine how happy he was at the end of that little episode. Another thing that I find funny, and you may not find this funny, but I find funny, was in 1934 when my mother and Aunt Bessie and Aunt Marie graduated from Peter's Township, all in the same class. Aunt Marie had skipped a grade. Mother was in her grade. Aunt Bessie had been held back a grade because of health conditions. So the girls decided that they were not going to ride the bus to school. They were going to hitch up one of the horses that they still had, and they were going to take the, the um, carriage, and they were going to go to high school for their last day of high school. Can you imagine their senior year? Okay, 1934. They hitched it up, took off. They had to go to Peter's Township High School at McMurray Road and so forth. As they were getting there, the horse raised his tail and sprayed them all. <laughs> they had to go to high school their senior year, last day, looking like that. You can imagine how upset they were. I cracked up when I heard this. See, this is stuff Aunt Marie would tell me, but she, you know, nobody else. My mother, no, 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 nothing like that ever happened. So it was very funny to me. But we would, whenever we wanted the truth, we would just ask Aunt Marie. You know, she'll tell you. Anybody else have any questions or anything? No? Okay, well, thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Do you have any idea where the Hayward farm was? The which Hay Hayward? Hayward, no, I'm sorry, I don't. 
I found a bottle. It was like around 19, and it was purple, so I know it was before 1917. <coughs> but I said, Hayward Farm, and it said Bridgeville. But I looked up some stuff at one time before, and they were from Upper St. Clair. So I was just wondering if you knew anything about that. No, but you could. In answer to you, there's a Hayward family and a Portman family that started out in Green Tree, and their properties joined in Green Tree. 1910, 12, 14, they bought on route what is now 519, which is now Portman's, and Hayward's owned that until 1932, 33. They all died off, and Portman's took it over. And since then, it's been Portman's. But we have the whole history on Hayward's. Wow. That's neat. Any other questions? Yes? We were talking about the settlers coming up the river. George Tears? Yes, and they gave the Indians the bridges and the hot water and the water. Pair of buckskin bridges. <coughs> Pardon me? Oh, a pair of buckskin bridges, a flintlock rifle. And, fire, and fire water. <coughs> yeah, don't forget the fire water, though. I think that was probably the most important thing, too. Yes? I just want to add on, you said that at a certain age stage, the students, senior high school, went to Mount Lebanon. Yes. They had the option of going there or coming to Bridgeville. Correct. So we got one or two or three of them a year, but we were involved in that to a small degree. Yeah, my brother graduated from Mount Lebanon in 1958, and he had been given the option. He could either go to Peters Township or he could go to, right. to Mount Lebanon. Right. Yeah, but he graduated in 58. Now, when Lou and I came along, um, they had already started to create Upper St. Clair High School, so we just stayed at Fort Couch and kept going through. So we went from 9 to 10, 11, and 12 there. But um, Upper St. Clair High School itself, the new high school, was not created, I think, until 1961, they three. started it. Yeah. Yes? Three. Yeah, three. Uh, first three classes, 60, 61, and 62, went to Fort Couch. Correct. Then in the fall of 62, the high school opened. Yeah. In fact, um, it was a bone of contention that um, when we graduated from Fort Couch, everybody said, well, then you didn't graduate from Upper St. Clair High School. And I said, what? <laughs> so, so on my class ring, I don't understand what you're talking about. But, and as I have said to Lou earlier, I said, it's like saying you didn't graduate from Pitt because you didn't take any classes in the Cathedral of Learning. <laughs> we, we always got to even with them, though. Yes, we, we did. Our, our 50th anniversary, we had a large plaque made and put in the main lobby down at the new high school. And it had every person from the class of 60 and 61. And then it was titled, First Graduating Classes of Upper St. Clair. Yeah. <laughs> Just so they didn't forget us. <laughs> Any other comments or anything to add? Yes? Uh, Whenever we, we were the class of 62, uh -huh. and we did walk through the, the new high school. It wasn't done. It was under construction. It was under construction, but we walked through, you know, the gym or whatever. I can't remember whether the gym or the, right. auditor or the auditorium was done. But then whenever, years later, uh, they were having uh, a reunion or there was some there was some homecoming and they decided that we were the first graduating class from Upper St. Clair High School. And no matter what we told them, you know, we said, No, we're not, you know. But anyway, they decided that we were and they wouldn't take no for an answer. So we handed the you know, we did we crowned the, the homecoming queen and all, did all that and they insisted even in the newspaper it says that we were the class of 1963. Too funny. Well it was always funny to us when we would hear that because be, because we didn't have a high school when we were first going into Upper St. Clair um, high school years 
our class and the class ahead of us, we were all very close because we were all, you know, forging ahead, making this high school, and nobody knew anything about how to be, you know, a high school senior or junior. So we were just forging things on our own. So we chose the colors for Upper St. Clair, which were black and white. We chose the alma mater, one of our um, men who was in the class of 60, a, a year ahead of Lou and I, uh, wrote the alma mater. So it's like, you know, wait a minute, we did an awful lot of things besides everything else. Like I was head majorette at Yale because we didn't have majorettes. We didn't have anything like that. We didn't have, we used to get killed by Mount Lebanon because we only had sophomores and juniors playing, you know, for football games and um, basketball games. Our guys went up and down the court all the time because we didn't have enough to field a whole lot of, you know, extra people out on, out on the, uh, the benches. But it was fun. I mean, we sat on the, the hillside overlooking the football game. We didn't have bleachers. We didn't have anything like that. It was just very primitive, but we had a good time. Our classes were very entwined. Yes. We, many of us still know each other today. We get along very well. Class of 60 and 61 especially. Uh, We've, we've had, I don't know how many meetings now since our 50th reunion. Mm -hmm. Another sport that you didn't mention there was track. I always remember that because I, I ran track. We'd go into track meets so many points behind it was almost impossible for us to ever win. <laughs> we didn't have hurdles, we didn't have javelin, we didn't have shot put. Right. So we went into these events minus points. <laughs> <laughs> All we had was the running stuff. Sure. Anything else? Anybody else want to have? Yes? Um, I could point out that in, uh, Bridgeville was the town part of Upper St. Clair and in 1951 or 1901 it became a separate borough. But um, since Upper St. Clair didn't have a high school, didn't have paved roads, didn't have sewers, didn't have water, water public water, um, when they would build new homes and people would petition Bridgeville to annex them. So in 1951, a very large area from Weston Road, across McLaughlin Run, up where Cook School was, across Bowery Hill Road, all of that went into Bridgeville in 1951 because the people yeah, who had the new homes went out of Upper St. Clair. Right. Is that what they call uh, Bridgemont? Well, that's one part of the area. Yeah. One part of all that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else want to have anything else? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
um, basically where if if you're if you're coming along on Route 19 south from South Hills Village, and just as you cross where Old Washington mm -hmm. Road crosses over Route 19, then it was down a little bit further, and it was on the right hand side. Before you get to Boyce Road. Before you get to Boyce Road. Yeah. On the right hand side. Mm -hmm. I think, isn't it where all those uh, businesses are in there right now? Mm -hmm. They have all those houses. Well, they look like houses in there. That's all the business area. Right. I think that's where it was right in that section. Oh really? Well, I know that th I know that there was one that. Um, if you go back on here. I'll leave this, I, I can leave this up for you if you'd like to come up and take a look at it because this is Upper St. Clair in um, 1876 um, and most of the families who, who were the original ones were still in this area so um, if you come up here you can read the names and see where their, their driveways are located and see the streets. You can pretty well cover, figure out where these streets all, all were. And I'll leave this on if you'd like to come up and do that. Wasn't the house on Hayes Road one of the first, the, the first five? Uh, the, the one that on Hayes as you go yeah, the, down the, um, Old Washington Road and take a left on Hayes, yeah, there the, is a red, red frame Yeah, it's red now. With yeah, the, but that, that was a later farmhouse from the early one. Right, but I thought that plot of land was where, where the first Jonathan Fife went. No. That's a Strickler Demuth house. Yeah, yeah that's that the was, house now. Yeah. yeah, it was the Demuth house because yeah. that was a friend of my grandfather's. Yeah. Yeah. They have that corn down there. Who, who was the one down the log cabin down in front of the old cliff section? You know who that family was? Say again. That, that log cabin that's down there now. In front of the, by the, by the, by the high school? Yeah. yeah. Somebody was telling me who that was. I've never. Right. On who they were. Wait, yes. somebody just told me that. Who was it? You, one of you were just explaining that the log cabin that's at the uh, bottom of the high school yeah. was somebody's. Oh, Larry's home. Larry. That's, the pal that's where the pellets uh, mm -hmm. came from. Is that pellets uh, log cabin? Pellets. Yes. Yeah. It belonged to Gil Phil and they were tenants. They were tenants. Yeah. They rented from the Gil Phillies. The pellets lived there and then they built their place across the road. They had a, a blacksmith shop and wagon shop across the road from that. Mm -hmm. And then the oldest son stayed there and the parents and the younger ones came to Bridgeville and opened a blacksmith shop here in Bridgeville and then the heart was gone. You know your history of Upper St. Clair. Who, whoever, yeah, he's the expert. Whoever, whoever was the last nut, could I ask a question of you? Harry. Sorry. Okay. Question. Um, I was told that when the Lessons first came from the east to Upper St. Clair, that they built a lean-to, and it was just Mr. Lessons and two boys, yes. and he, he built a lean-to, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And then he left the boys and went back to left, the they east. Were, they were teenagers, and he left them here over the winter and went oh, back. Over the winter. And then the Indians helped them, yes. took them in. Wasn't there also a guard? No, I think it was just the two boys. I can add something to that. They okay. were not in Upper St. Clair. They were in South Fayette originally. They came to Upper St. Clair later. Oh. Plus it began in South Fayette. Started out on Cold Pit Run. Yeah, that's right, over at Alpine Road area. Cold Pit Run. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Yes? The Gilkesons. Anybody know anything about the Gilkesons? They were. That was almost Von Lundman there. Yeah. yeah. Gilkeson Road. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's the Gilkeson Road after that. Mm -hmm. I don't remember where the family actually was. I don't remember their farmhouse either. Yes. They say the farmhouse is as you head north on the right. There's a lighthouse near the businesses. 
Oh, I've been told that's our. Huh. Um, we got the wrong, wrong ones to ask, I guess. <laughs> okay, anything else? Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You've been very sweet.